All right, everyone. It is 11 o'clock on the dot. Um, many thanks to everyone uh, for joining us on this um, wonderful webinar. Uh, my name is Lisa Simmons. I'm the National Museum of Wildlife Arts Associate Curator of Art, and I will be facilitating uh, the introductions and question and answer session that will take place after the panelists' presentations. Um, so again, thanks all for participating. Uh, the webinar is entitled Bird Migration and Artful Perspective. It will explore the way bird migration and rehabilitation is represented in art and the historical importance of art as a means of scientific discovery. The webinar panelists are Sari Ann Flatt, the National Museum of Wildlife Arts Lillian Thomas and Gamar Education Intern, and Sarah Pruden, the Teton Raptor Center's Acting Education Director. Sarah Ann's presentation will feature artwork from the permanent collection of the National Museum of Wildlife Art by artists James Prosek and Allison Lee Smith. And Sarah's presentation will feature some avian actors who are education birds from the Teton Raptor Center. So the melding of art and science and natural history is so fun. Um, so I, first I'd like to outline the flow of today's program. We will start with a short Zoom webinar tutorial after which our panelists will take the stage. First, Sarah Ann from the museum, uh, then Sarah from the Teton Raptor Center, after which there will be time for a question and answer at the end. We participate, this program will last about an hour, uh, and if questions keep us longer than that, we are happy to stick around. Um, so let's take a little Zoom tour. Uh, first, mm -hmm. please note again that we cannot see you and we cannot hear you. Uh, you could put on a circus in your living room and we would not know it. <laughs> Uh, even though we can't see you, we would love for you to participate. Um, and there are two ways to do this. The first way is by using the chat window. Um, a lot of you have already been using that to introduce yourselves and where you're from. Um, and that chat window is accessible <laughs> from um, the bottom of your screen at that chat icon. So just um, roll your pointer down there and you will see it. Um, it's always fun to see the wide variety of places our webinar attendees are watching from. So if you'd like to practice using that, um, feature, the chat feature, you can type in your name and where you're from. Uh, and the second feature you can use to participate is the Q&A window, um, accessible from the Q&A icon at the bottom. Uh, please use this chat feature to offer comments during the web, uh, to, to offer questions during the webinar. Um, the uh, questions should be offered only through the Q&A window. Um, simply type in specific questions for the panelists that will be answered after they are done speaking. Again, chat for comments, Q&A for questions. Um, and please note that in the coming days, we will email all attendees with the webinar recording for you to share with others or watch to your heart's content. All right, uh, I am excited to present Sari Ann Platt, the National Museum of Wildlife Arts Lillian Thomas and Gamar Education Intern, as the creative mastermind behind this webinar, Bird Migration and Artful Perspective. Sari's connection with birds is evident in her writing that contemplates the relationship between avian rehabilitation and the way society perceives people with both chronic and mental illness. Before joining the museum team, she worked as a college level composition and creative writing instructor and in wildlife rehabilitation. Sari recently moved to Jackson from Corvallis, Oregon, and she completed her Master of Fine Arts degree in creative nonfiction writing at Oregon State University. I am also very excited to present Sarah Pruden, the Raptor Center's Acting Director of Education. Sarah obtained her bachelor's degree in environmental science and policy at Southern Oregon University. And while attending school there, she also spent time interning as a wildlife care specialist, participating in mammal rehabilitation and education development. After graduating, Sarah made her way back to Wyoming, made her way to Wyoming to work with Teton Science Schools as an AmeriCorps field education member. And in that process came into an opportunity that arose for her to join the Teton Raptor Center's education team as an AmeriCorps intern. And she is now um, the acting uh, education director at the Teton Raptor Center. Mm -hmm. um, and Sarah's presentation will discuss the exciting raptor migration research happening in Jackson. And she will share the incredible work that rehabilitation centers do. Now, without further ado, um, Sari Ann, uh, please take it away. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen really quick. 
Can everyone see it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So hello, as Lisa said in her really sweet introduction, my name is Sarah Ann, and I'm really excited to be here with you all today and appreciate living in a time where when we cannot connect, when we cannot connect in person, we have the option to connect virtually. So we aren't as far apart as maybe it seems. Um, so I wanna start off this webinar by talking about some history related to migration and ornithological discovery, and then move on to talk about two amazing pieces that the museum has in their permanent collection. Let's see. Okay. So bird migration, as we roughly understand it today, was only discovered in about the 1800s. So what did people believe before that? Where did they think birds went in the middle of winter? Um, I first want to clarify that the naturalists that I'm talking about today are writing and studying birds from a white Eurocentric perspective, and that beliefs about bird migration, its significance, and cultural importance varies widely throughout the world. I feel that it is extremely important to acknowledge this angle as many of the historic naturalists that I'll be talking about had a pretty privileged upbringing in Western Europe and had certain biases that informed some of their scientific work outside of the scope of what we'll be talking about today. So surely the phenomenon of birds disappearing every winter had to be considered a bizarre occurrence by Europeans. And this was met with equally bizarre theories about where the birds went and why they left. One of the more well-known theories was written in the 17th century by an English minister and scientist, Charles Morton. He wrote in a document that is surprisingly well-reasoned, albeit wildly inaccurate, that he believed that birds migrated to the moon and back every single year, refuting the previously held belief made popular by Aristotle that birds hibernated by burying themselves in the mud or sleeping underwater. Morton argued that this was illogical, it was completely ridiculous because the birds obviously wouldn't be able to breathe. Um, but he is right. I can't say that the moon was a more logical explanation though. Um, but just to throw out some fun numbers for you, Morton estimated that the one-way trip to the moon would be about 180,000 miles, which in reality wasn't extremely far off considering that the moon varies mm -hmm. from about 226,000 to 252,000 miles away depending on where it is in its elliptical orbit. So Morton posited from this information that it would take the birds about 60 days to reach the moon if they flew at a consistent 125 miles per hour straight up not taking any detours or resting even once. Um, despite that theory being incredibly inaccurate, Morton did correctly note that some birds can perceive changes in the air and the alteration of the availability of food. Um, and that sort of informed part of his theory about why they would start to migrate rather than just bury themselves under the water. So a large part of this theory was based on the idea at the time that all of the planets in our solar system must be inhabited in some way. Um, since a higher power wouldn't have gone through all the stress and trouble of creating all these planets if they didn't intend to populate them in some way. So Morton theorized that the birds flew to the moon in search of an abundance of vegetation and water that the planet would supposedly supply. However, in 1676, a man by the name Francis Willoughby, who was a pretty well-known naturalist at the time, um, would challenge the theories laid down by Morton and his predecessors when he published his book, Ornithologia, which is a masterwork of both bird science and artistic skill that falls in line with the likes of John James Audubon's Birds of America. So unlike Morton, Willoughby found that the theory of birds flying to the moon would be too far-fetched and hypothesized that birds were simply flying to Africa in search of warmer weather. Um, on the screen, I want to share some of Willoughby's incredible illustrations that are considered by many ornithologists today 
to be the first scientifically accurate images of birds produced for study in Europe. The images you see here allowed naturalists all over the continent to study birds they had never seen in depth before for the first time. Um, and it revealed for the first time just how far many of these birds traveled, as people say from both England and maybe Spain could recognize the image of the same bird, but recognize that they also saw them at different times of year. So however accurate Willoughby's images have been, we cannot credit him for discovering migration as we fully understand it to exist today, but I will get to that in just a minute. So throughout his career, which was pretty short, Willoughby died at the age of 36. Um, he described and dissected every bird he thought to be known at the time, which ended up being about 500. Today, we suspect there to be about 10,000 species of bird in the world. Um, he also was one of the first to classify his illustrations. And this was the starting point of subsequent research done by the likes of Carl Linnaeus, who many recognize widely today for his use of Latin classification method known as system naturae. Um, and we'll come back to Morton's illustrations a little later and talk about how they've influenced some of the artists at our museum. So I want to move on now to talk about a pivotal moment in the discovery of bird migration and how it works. We're going back to Germany in the spring of 1822 when a hunter shot a white stork. When the hunter collected the stork, he found, piercing the bird through the neck, an iron-tipped wooden spear from Central Africa. The craftsmanship that went into making the spear is a work of art unto itself, I think. Um, so local newspapers at the time named this bird the arrow stork, um, and a German word I cannot unfortunately pronounce. And the creature was celebrated for solving the puzzle of where white storks spent their winters. And the arrow stork would eventually inspire the use of GPS tracking devices that we use today to study bird migration. And if you ever happen to be in Germany, you can visit the University of Rostock and their zoological collection and take a look at this exact specimen, which is a white stork that has been stuffed with the original spear going through its neck in the placement that the hunter supposedly found it in. So now that I've shared some historical background about migration and the discovery of migration, I want to move into talking about two amazing contemporary artists at NMWA um, has in their permanent collection, starting with Alison Lee Smith. So I was not familiar with Smith's work until joining the museum team and instantly fell in love with her use of bright pastel colors, her hyper-realism, and profound messages that she imbues in her artwork. I've shared just a couple of her pieces of art on the screen, but today we'll be talking about only one piece in detail. I first wanna start off with a little bit of background about Smith as she is a super fascinating person and I think we could be friends if we ever met. Um, so over the last several years, Smith has become deeply involved in wildlife rescue and rehabilitation volunteering her time at animal sanctuaries and connecting with people all over North America to learn their stories about animals and share them with a wider audience. In her own words, she says, I no longer differentiate between my vocation and avocation. The work I do for animals, although difficult, intimidating and humble, is the most emotional and meaningful of my life. Um, and you can see in one of the pictures here she is, has a hawk on her back and she frequently visits rehab centers in Arizona where she spent a significant portion of her life. So Smith starts her paintings often by taking photographs of the animals that she wants to depict. She captures a variety of poses and uses their natural positions in her compositions to help ensure a deeper level of scientific accuracy. Um, and you'll notice in her work you can look at the one on the bottom of the screen here. Um, Smith does not generally depict animals in their natural habitat. Um, the sky is removed from the background completely. It's a pretty plain background, even though this work is just a work in progress. Um, 
And rather than depict them in a natural background, she superimposes them onto a wide variety of beautiful, albeit unnatural backgrounds. Um, however, when I look at her work, the animals always feel somewhat relaxed, like they're supposed to be there. Um, and I think this feeling comes from the mass amount of time she spends studying and interacting with her subjects. She knows these animals really, really well, and it comes across in her work. Some of her paintings also incorporate her photography or in some cases digital manipulation, um, but she professes that she usually keeps this pretty well hidden. So the piece that we have in our collection and that I wanna spend time talking about is called The Common Thread. And I've pulled that up on the screen for you now. I wanna start by talking about the background. As I just mentioned, it's a little bit unnatural. It's not where you would find these um, two birds out in the wild. So when Smith eventually moved to Arizona from Hawaii, she began working as a textile designer for both the quilting world and then eventually for fashion. And I think in this painting, you can really see the influence of that in the background, where the top edge looks like this intricate lace pattern um, and sports the repeating pattern of two hummingbirds facing away from each other, both at the bottom and throughout the lace design. Um, so after moving from Hawaii to Arizona, Smith began volunteering um, at the local wildlife rehab center. And that is when she began photographing the birds and she got really invested in painting birds. Um, before she was mostly painting mammals, so this was really the start of her career in terms of painting birds. Um, so she was looking really for a way to share their stories and the stories of the incredible rehabbers that she worked with. And today, even though she only spends part of her time in Arizona, her friends there continue to share photos of the birds with her. Um, and in return, she shares the profits of her paintings with her bird subjects to kind of go towards their care and help the rehab centers um, stay open. So the piece you're looking at now is said to be especially meaningful to Smith as it features a barn owl named Amigo, who you can see on the left there, and whom she got to know at Wild at Heart, a raptor rescue organization in Arizona. Amigo is a permanent resident and education bird at Wild at Heart who helps to inform the public about the threats facing raptors in North America. And when talking to our museum about Amigo, Smith mentioned that he has turned out to be one of her favorite subjects to paint. Apparently he is very photogenic, enjoys posing quite a bit. Um, so she ultimately chose to pair Amigo with a hummingbird in this painting. And this hummingbird, she said, is one particular hummingbird that frequented her feeder during a particularly hot summer. Um, meaning that both of these subjects are incredibly personal to her. However, she notes that these species are rather opposite of one another. Amigo is a large, nocturnal male and a meat eater, and the hummingbird is a small, diurnal, meaning awake during the day, female, and as Smith puts it, a sweets eater. Um, she placed them together in what she calls a warm, happy place. And um, in order to create a sort of optimistic metaphor that she kind of trends with throughout her work. So in her own words, she says, though differences may seem extreme, we are all beautiful and essential, not in spite of our differences, but precisely because of them. And ultimately, we are all connected. If you look closely at this painting, um, you can see a faint orange thread that wraps around both the barn owls and the hummingbirds' toes, it connects them literally and brings Smith's incredibly important metaphor to life. With that message, I think it's time to transition back into talking a little bit more about migration and another incredible piece of artwork done by the artist James Prozac. So again, a little bit of helpful background about Prozac. Um, he is a well-known artist known for his veristic, intricate, and detailed portrayal of the world's creatures. His goal is largely to celebrate the biodiversity of the natural world while promoting awareness of the species endangerment through painting and also writing and filmmaking. In his own words, Prozac says, I am less interested in the animals themselves than I am in the way we as humans see them. 
And perhaps this is an excellent lead into talking about his work. Um, we have a couple of our pieces in our collection, but I will mostly be concentrating on only one of them called American Elk, um, which we actually have hanging up in our museum right now. So Prozac heavily features silhouettes in his work, and perhaps this gestures to what he is speaking about in his quote. That is, it is less about the individual animal and more about the human perception of them. At first glance, Prozac's work feels somewhat like the scientific illustrations of Morton, and I would argue that Smith's does as well. There's this hyper-realism that they're both engaging with. Um, this painting, American Elk, is carefully rendered with an elk in full color, as well as a few of the birds and other avian friends, um, which are partially hidden or basically completely hidden behind um, very dark black silhouettes. Like in this painting, Prozac often seems to partially isolate a particular animal or animals, pulling them slightly from their natural environment, which is reminiscent of the illustrations that you might see in a field guide. They don't often include a lot of the natural environment in those. And you can see here there's some sparse foliage and vegetation, um, but we can't really get a full sense of the environment he's standing in, and he almost seems to be floating. So back to migration, the animals featured in this piece are all known to migrate in and out of Yellowstone to varying degrees, some just from one location to another, um, or like the elk featured in the center of the artwork who spends his winters right outside the museum's door with about 10,000 of his friends on the elk refuge. And although the silhouetted birds are hard to identify, the blacked out images reference something more metaphorical in the work. Um, humans see boundaries in many aspects of our lives. We build them purposefully between states, between cities, borders, between countries, and even just the doors that open and close separating the inside of the grocery store from the outside. However, non-human animals don't perceive these boundaries um, when they go to migrate each year. And like the silhouetted birds in this piece, our human boundaries are invisible to them. The seasonal migration of each of these animals is extremely important to maintain the delicate balance of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. In Prezek's own words, he says, we think that just by replacing a missing puzzle piece that the ecosystem will be okay again. And that may be true to a certain extent, but it's certainly not the whole story. And I think you can see his reference to puzzle pieces in this artwork specifically, because we have some birds that are visible, they're in full color, and then we have other pieces that are missing. So just as we saw in Smith's piece, there is more linking these animals together than their shared migration paths. They're connected on an essential level and their biodiversity fuels and supports the health of the ecosystem at large. So to finish out my portion of the webinar, I wanna put Smith's and Prozac's work on screen together so you can all see how similar and yet different they are. Both works, um, both artists work with a deep sense of commitment to advocacy for the natural world. They engage in this hyper-realistic art style that is reminiscent of scientific illustration. To me, this style almost seems objective and free of bias in some way. Like they're trying to convey the critters from outside our limited human scope and perception. Um, and I think they kind of achieve this at least somewhat by portraying them in this super realistic way. However, I wanna draw our attention once more to the backgrounds that each artist chose. Smith, a background that is reminiscent of textiles and Prozac, just a stark white plain. Despite these animals being inextricable from their natural, natural surroundings in real life, both they and their surroundings depend on one another, but here they are depicted without. For myself, I still wonder, I wonder about the effect of, wonder what the effect of this truly is. Does this make their message clearer for you or more difficult to read? Does it draw questions that are new and exciting? Um, does it cause you to look at this in a new way or kind of consider the world around you in a different way? I think these questions are always worth thinking about, even if we don't have all the answers. Um, it is now my pleasure to turn the second half of this webinar over 
to Sarah from the Teton Raptor Center. Thank you so much for doing this collaboration with me. Thank you, Sarah Ann. That was amazing. Um, I really, really enjoy all the topics you touched on as I will retouch back on those um, quite a bit as I go on. Um, so yeah, I um, am coming from more of the science and rehabilitation side of things, um, tying that in with the, the art that Sarianne so lovely or wonderfully talked about. Um, and again, our background at the Teton Raptor Center uh, comes in with education. So exactly what we're doing right now, we have a, a group of us here that go out into the public, um, into the community, into schools and classrooms and have done so for over a decade here in Jackson. Uh, in order to educate the community on how important raptors are in their environment and what an important role they play. Um, as I'll talk about later and as Carrie Ann touched on, they're all so connected in so many ways. Um, secondly, we have a rehabilitation team which uh, does amazing things for birds from all over Wyoming and eastern Idaho. Um, we work with all different government organizations. We, we communicate with all different um, land and uh, land use and management organizations and um, work really hard to treat any, any wild raptors that come into us um, and get them back out into the wild. Uh, so we have a great return rate for the, the birds we do treat. Currently right now we have four osprey, which are a migratory bird species perfect for this presentation. Um, and those guys uh, are all young and we're working hard and doing our best to get them out um, to get on their way with migration as, as the cold nights here in Jackson Hole are getting back down into the 30s. Um, among those, we have at least 11 other birds right now in our rehabilitation center. Um, and that is a, a group effort. Our rehab staff works very hard and the education and research staff all lend our hands when necessary to help with those birds and getting them back out to the wild. Um, and then we have a research team, which I just kind of mentioned, and they do some amazing stuff as well. So they give us the ability um, to share with you guys some crazy things that we're learning about raptors and their migration behavior. Um, and a lot of those things have to do with tracking where they're going. And um, as Sari or Sari Ann uh, mentioned earlier, we started out thinking that birds migrated to the moon and hung out there for the winter. Um, along with that, it was, uh, you know, maybe they hibernate. Oh, no, maybe they go underwater and turn into fish. Um, <laughs> so there were a lot of different uh, types of, of thoughts and ideas about how migration kind of occurred. Um, and I'll talk about that just in just a moment, but it's really, really cool to kind of note um, how much we've learned about migration uh, with these guys in like the last 50 years even. Um, so yeah, I, I, one thing I do want to touch on before I go deeply into that is um, raptors in general. So I keep saying this word raptor. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with raptors, um, many of you may be, but I'm just going to go re-go over it for all of us. Um, raptors are a specific type of bird of prey, but they are very specialized. Um, so we have five categories of raptors in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Those are eagles, hawks, falcons, osprey, and owls. Um, and we have such a biodiverse, amazing, intact ecosystem here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, as Sarian touched on before, um, that we have an immense amount of different types of species of raptors that visit us throughout the year on their migratory journey. So we have over 30 species of raptors that come and hang out specifically here, um, either on their journey or as a destination. Uh, which is amazing, um, to say the least. It, it is an amazing environment to um, exist in, and it is it an amazing environment to do research and rehabilitation in as well. Um, now that we all know, you know, what raptors are and the kind of categories we're talking about, we do have 14 education birds here at Teton Raptor Center, and today you will be meeting three. I have these three right here. Um, these guys are all permanent residents with us. So all of our education birds are injured in some way or another um, that keep them from surviving in the wild. And those injuries generally have to do with uh, affecting the way that they would hunt or fly or something like that. So 
Um, these guys were lucky, they were found by humans or um, came into contact with humans at some point, and I'll get to telling you each of their stories as we go on. Um, but they ended up with us, and so they are lifelong teachers now, um, and being kind of uh, an educator for their, or ambassador for their species. So um, they're, they're great teaching tools, as you can imagine, kids are kind of immediately whoa, you have a bird and, and, and great, um, greatly drawn in. So they do great work for their species. Um, but yeah, back to the really entertaining ideas we had about migration. Um, so birds, of course, do not go to the moon and they um, also do not turn into fish. We've found that out. Uh, surprise, surprise. Um, so birds, we, we had so many questions and we just had really no way of, of coming to terms of realizing where they actually went um, in the 1800s and even 19, early 1900s. Um, and so the basically what happened and, and what kind of spurred the discovery besides that great stork um, who, or I think it was a stork, uh, who had that, you know, shot through the neck with an arrow, survived miraculously through that experience, made an entire migration, which is unthinkable with that, with that uh, whole thing going on in his neck um, and eventually came to his end by being shot. Um, but that was that first kind of, oh my goodness, this bird spent some time somewhere very far away from us. Um, moving on from there, um, in Europe, there was something called the systematic ringing, which is uh, bird banding, basically, and that began in the very beginning of the 20th century. And that was the very beginning of us going, okay, how are we going to track these guys? Well, let's put these numbers, these tiny little bands with numbers on them, unique to each bird, um, and then trap them and try to see where they're going or try to even, you know, see those guys with binoculars and kind of get an idea of how far they, they migrate and how far they go. Um, and that really started to give us an opportunity to understand what actually was happening with these birds and that they weren't going to the moon and they weren't going underwater and they were not hibernating, but in fact, they were making these incredible journeys across some parts of the world um, for some of these birds. And uh, we started to begin to understand that. And then in the early to mid 80s, 1980s, we started to use satellite tracking on some of these birds to get an even bigger picture of what was going on with um, their ability to migrate and where they were going. So really, really amazing work, even in the last 50 years. Um, I'll go into deeper details on some of the birds I have today, but um, just, crazy, right? So um, the types of migration that we do see here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and all over the world um, are long-term mi long distance migrators, um, short distance migrators, sporadic migrators who might, you know, decide to migrate 30 miles one year and none the next year, depending on a lot of different attributes and aspects. Um, and then the ones that just hang out and they don't really migrate. And we'll meet one of each of those guys today. Um, and along with that, as we go into talking about these birds in migration, it's also uh, really important to note the dangers, the risks, and the costs of migration for these birds. So they are so connected to their environments. They are um, such important pieces of even their stopover environments when they decide that somewhere in Utah is a great place to hang out for three weeks on their migration. They play an important role in that environment. So. It's really nice to understand um, just exactly what the risks and costs are for these species and these migratory birds and, and maybe ways that we can help to mitigate these risks and these, um, these costs that they face on their way. Um, so with that, I'm going to transition. I'm gonna get one of these guys out on my glove so you can see this gracefully happen on, on live webinar. Uh, and the first guy that I have, is the smallest one and some of you may recognize him uh, but he is definitely a migrator he is an american kestrel so american kestrels this guy's name is frost um, these guys are well known for being migratory members of our environment here in wyoming um, and they're also year-round residents in specific other types of environments so I'll tell you guys Frost's story and then I'll kind of talk a little bit about why he's with us and how these guys migrate in general. Um, Frost, again, is an American kestrel. He is anywhere from five to eight years old. We don't know because he was an adult when he joined our team. Um, and this guy 
was a victim of something happening to him during migration. So he migrated probably from somewhere up in the Wyoming um, area, maybe down in Colorado, and he was making his migration down for the winter south. Um, as you can tell, these guys are not made for cold weather. Six feet of snow is gonna be a little challenging for this kid to find food. Uh, and so when he migrates, he migrates somewhere probably to Texas, New Mexico, um, the south, southern and southwestern parts of the United States. For this guy, he chose Texas and he made his way down to Texas and he got all the way there, all the way through the migration, the different risks and, and, and different dangers that he faces during migration. And then when he got to Texas, an ice storm hit and he was the victim of getting stuck to a metal pole. So we all know what happens from, you know, the movie A Christmas Story when we lick something that's really, really cold or you put something wet on, the, on something that's frozen, it freezes to it. And the tip of this guy's left wing was frozen to a metal pole during that ice storm. Um, he was saved by a human that was out during the storm, found him hanging from a metal pole, brought him into a rehab center, rehabilitation center. Um, but the end of that left wing had suffered frostbite. So he ended up getting a partial amputation on that left side. Um, and you can see there's feathering here that he does not have on that left side. And that inhibits his ability to sustain flight. So being a migrator and a, a pretty far migrator from this ecosystem, American kestrels need to have that ability to sustain flight. And they also need that for hunting as well. Um, so for this guy, that meant immediately, well, all right, you're not gonna survive in the wild. What can we do with you instead? And uh, the answer to that was education. So he joined our education team and has been a really great teacher with us for the last four years. Um, but again, American kestrels are tiny, right? They're the smallest members of the falcon family that we have in the, in the northern U.S. And these guys are not even the smallest of, the, of those birds that are flying through the air and migrating. Um, and so they are both short distance and long distance migrators, which is pretty interesting. If they exist in an environment kind of like Wyoming, where the winters are extremely harsh, um, these guys will migrate pretty far down south, so hundreds of miles down to Texas, um, in order for them to have a successful uh, winter and, and be able to breed that next spring. Um, one interesting thing about kestrels specifically is that these guys uh, are known for leaving at different times to migrate based on if they're male or female. So females uh, are more aggressive, they're bossy, and they're a bit bigger than the males. Um, and the females will actually leave first and they'll go down south and set up territories. Um, and they get really nice spots, right? So they pick the best spot for themselves, they get to hang out, it's, it's the most open, best hunting area for them. The females set it up and they've got a good life. They're happy for the winter. The males who are smaller, less aggressive, they leave at a later date uh, and they usually end up setting up a territory near a wooded area um, with a little bit less access to their hunting grounds and things like that. So um, kind of based on their dominance uh, and that's kind of a trait that will dictate some other types of birds um, migration behavior as well. But these guys definitely exhibit that and that's a, a pretty cool aspect of how these guys survive and how they interact with their environment as well. Again, there are some of these guys that exist in the southern and western um, parts of the U.S. and even eastern parts of the U.S. Uh, in more temperate zones that are just there year-round. And they just hang out. They're living a good life. They get food all year-round. They have babies. They don't have to fly super far. Um, but for this guy and for the ones that do exist up in the harsher environments, uh, it does require them to migrate. Um, you may wonder, you know, why would some of them migrate and some of them decide to stay? Um, and that comes down to competition for food, but it also comes down to what they learned from their parents as well. Um, so at some point, a parent was pushed out and decided, well, I'm going to set off on my own and I'm going to find um, a place for myself to be uh, successful and find food. And so they maybe ended up in Utah or maybe up in Colorado. Um, and from there, the next generation maybe moved a little bit further north. But every, every winter, they'll have to migrate back south. Pretty neat. Um, so among kestrels, we have a lot of other smaller migratory birds. I'm going to put frost away now. Um, that, that exists within our environment in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And like I said, we have over 30 species of birds that uh, visit us every year. Um, every, or 30 species of raptors, I 
sorry, um, that visit us every year. And that is an amazingly diverse amount, right? So um, for example, Alabama has the most biodiversity and it's in like two miles of a river system uh, than any other state in the US. And they have only about 17 different raptors that will um, visit or migrate through or live year round in that area. So that really speaks to um, the amazing kind of intact uh, ecosystem we have, an environment we have here to support these wild animals. Um, and as I move on from frost, that, that kind of goes into uh, the next bird I'm gonna get out, which um, exists in our environment and not really anywhere else in the US. Um, so, pardon me while I get her out. You may or may not recognize this lady, um, but, and she may jump off my glove, apologies. She's, she's, she tries to her best to be really delicate and, uh, uh, you know, balanced, but sometimes it's, it doesn't work so well. Um, so this is a great gray owl, and these guys exist, um, can you, uh, will exist in our environment and then anywhere further north based on the um, connectivity of the forest and also, the health of the environment as well and the temperature. So um, as we were talking about with frost, those are long term or long distance and short distance migrators. Whereas taiga, the great gray owl, is a sporadic to no migration migrator. Um, these guys are really funny and our research team has been doing some of the most in-depth research with these guys for the last six, seven years. Um, she'll look everywhere, so she'll be distracting, but we'll work with it. Um, so basically, these guys, there's so much not known about them because they're so, so, so um, kind of secretive and really good at hiding in their environment, which her coloration kind of shows you. If she was in an aspen tree stand or something like that, she'd be really, really good at blending in. Um, and these guys in general, there's not much known about their behavior also because there hasn't been very much done research-wise in the US at least. Um, for our, our research, our studies we have conducted, we've realized a lot of different things about their behavior. Some of those have to do with being able to identify certain great gray owls over other great gray owls. Um, their hoot, for instance, is very specific to each owl, which is pretty cool. Um, and then their migration behavior uh, is really unique. So some of these birds, some of these great gray owls, uh, will decide that live here in Jackson Hole, uh, will decide to go down to um, maybe 40, 50 miles, maybe 60 miles at the most south of Jackson Hole for the winter. Uh, very, very random. It, it's, it kind of doesn't really, um, there's no specific, you know, these owls that live in this area in Jackson Hole will always migrate that far, or uh, these owls that live up in the park will always migrate that far. It changes every year. Um, so we have owls that one year decide, I'm gonna stay in Jackson Hole and I'm not gonna move from this spot and I'm just gonna be lazy and eat all the mice and all the voles. Uh, and then we have owls that are up in Grand Teton National Park and then they decide they're gonna go further north for the winter, uh, I don't know and uh, hang out in Yellowstone and then come back down here in the summer. Um, so really truly these guys are sporadic and very erratic migrators. Um, and there's so much not known about them that our current uh, great gray owl biologist, Catherine Guerrera, who works with us and has, has been on this research project for over six years, is currently getting her PhD with her um, research based on trying to figure out what, what dictates their migration behavior. So um, really, really neat. And I'll tell you a little bit about Tyga's story as we're going. So um, this bird was in a nest that we had uh, been observing and uh, we were planning to put GPS trackers on her uh, and her four siblings that were also in the nest. Um, and they were about ready to fledge, which is when birds are ready to fly and leave the nest and go on and do their own thing. Uh, and we do the GPS trackers so we can kind of see where they end up. What is what, you know, what is the general um, kind of females go this far, males go this far, or are they sporadic in the way that they fledge and leave the nest as well? Um, so we were going, we hiked in, it was like a 10 mile hike to get to the nest that they were in. And what we realized when we came upon the nest is that something else had found that nest uh, in between the last time they were there and this time. Um, and the thing that found the nest was most likely a black bear. 
And that black bear did what, what bears and other predators do, and it consumed most of the babies that had been in that nest, but left her on the ground with a broken wing. So she was found um, and she was quickly sent from our research kind of branch into our rehabilitation center. Uh, and this bird was treated, but her left or her right wing, which you can't see right now with the way she's turned, was kind of sticking out straight from her body. Um, and it had healed that way. So these guys have a different bone structure than we do. It's hollow and their hollow bones heal a lot faster than ours. So within the 10 day period that she had been injured and then left to sit on the ground, her wing had healed and it was sticking out straight. Um, not usable, not function, not functioning, um, and definitely not going to allow her to fly. Uh, so when she came into our rehab setting, we spent mo many months with her, um, treating her, getting her healthy again, um, and kind of thinking about that wing and what we were going to do about it. Um, and then once we decided that she was going to be an education bird and was not releasable back to the wild, it was about a year after she joined our education team that we decided, okay, um, number one priority for our education birds is that they have a very comfortable and uh, very, very good life. Um, and that these guys uh, have the highest standard of living, they have the highest comfort level that they possibly can. So when she had that wing that was kind of sticking out and hanging off, it was very uncomfortable for her. And it also caused a lot of problems and would eventually become arthritic. Um, and so for her, for her, uh, well-being and also for their care moving forward with her as she stays with us throughout her entire life, um, we elected to have a partial wing amputation on that right wing uh, so she no longer had the extra weight, um, the pain, and the kind of cumbersomeness of carrying around that wing and hitting it on things. So for this bird, she is now four years old this year. Um, in her lifespan, she could reach 20 to 25 years with us in captivity. Um, their lifespan in the wild is about 20 years as well. So these guys are, are pretty amazing birds. Um, and they're a great example of being a non-migrator or a do whatever you want kind of migrator. Um, so they'll either stay in one place again or they will decide to erratically I'm going to go 50 miles south this year, that kind of thing. Um, pretty cool for her. But yeah, she'll, she'll remain with us for the rest of her life, obviously, from her, from her injuries. Um, but again, great, great owl research. There's, and, and the thing with migration in general, there's so much we don't know, uh, but so much we can learn every day. And that's one of the, one of the really cool things about science, too. Uh, and one of my favorite things about the scientific world um, is that even though there may be a lot that we don't know, that's the exciting part because that's our opportunity to jump in and say, okay, how are we going to learn this? What are we going to do? Um, and a lot of the things we're doing uh, in, consist of putting GPS trackers still on these guys, um, trying to understand what drives their migration um, and what factors in the environment may affect their choice to stay or not stay. Um, one thing that does happen, and that has happened um, in the last, you know, four or five years or so here in Jackson, uh, was a huge population drop. So that told us, okay, there was a mass migration, something happened, um, and we don't really know what, where these guys went or why. Uh, and then we looked at the weather, right? The weather is a big driver. Uh, and that year, it just so happened that there was a really large thaw-freeze event that occurred. Um, and that thaw-freeze thaw event had thawed the top of the snow and then frozen a really thick layer of ice. And so these guys hunt in a really unique way and that's how they can hang out here all year long. They hunt with hearing first and then sight. So during the winter when there's a bunch of snow and there's rodents running around under the snow, these guys listen, they find the rodent with their hearing and then they triangulate and punch through the snow with their feet without even having to see their prey. Um, so you can imagine if they had a really thick layer of ice, that's going to be really problematic for trying to punch through that ice or that snow and get their prey. So that's a big driver for these guys for their um, kind of migration or non-migration uh, or sporadic, we'll call them erratic migrators. Um, and that's kind of the great gray story as we go back into our kennel. Yay! And then my last bird yeah, is uh, going to be the largest bird, but one of the birds we've done the most research with um, on our research team regarding migration. So let's so get this guy out. Do, 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 do. This 
guy is gonna fly. He's like, no, we're in an office. Apologies, this is called baiting, is what they do when they're unsettled and then they'll come back to the glove and settle again. So, we're not house trained, you know? We're just kind of, we're birds, we're birds. So these guys, he's a golden eagle, if you didn't guess that by his size. Um, this is Gus, and golden eagles are one of the coolest migrators that we have that visit us in Wyoming. Um, so Gus is with us because he is not flighted. He never has been flighted. His right wing was injured um, in the nest, and this guy does not have the ability to fly and does not have the ability to extend his right wing. So unfortunately, Gus will never migrate, um, but he is a great ambassador for his species and he does a lot of great work with us. Um, but golden eagles in general, so our research team does a lot of trapping with golden eagles. And we go up every migration season, which is right now, and we trap golden eagles up in Montana. And what we're doing with them, yes, what we're doing with them uh, is basically putting GPS trackers on their tails um, and, and actually harnesses on their bodies as well. And the reason we do that is because we want to learn more about the highway that they use to migrate because these guys are very, very specific about their route every year. Um, so we have birds here in Wyoming that go all the way up to Alaska in the summertime and then come back down in the winter. And then we also have birds here in Wyoming that hang out all winter long. So they can, they're a long distance migrator, but they're also sporadic as well because some of these guys just don't, they just hang out and, and decide not to leave. Um, the reasoning behind that could be due to a couple things. One thing is dominance. So like I mentioned with the kestrels, um, the dominance with these guys would have to do with age. So the older birds may not leave the better, the better land, the better hunting. Um, they may remain in their one spot and decide they're not going to leave. Whereas the younger, can you please, um, whereas the younger birds may decide, okay, well, I have to migrate. I don't have as well, a good of access to um, the hunting grounds as the older birds that have, have been established and uh, existed in that area for quite some time. Um, the other reason that these guys are either really, really long distance migrators or hanging out here all winter uh, could come down to body size as well. Um, and that just means that if they have a larger body size, there's more room on their body for fat storage um, and the more scarce food uh, options during the winter wouldn't be as, as hard for them to deal with. Um, but yeah, golden eagles are, are amazing migrators. And like I said, we do trapping with these guys uh, in Montana during this month, so the month of October. Um, and there are days where we see over, you know, four or 500 different birds and maybe two to 300 of those are golden eagles in one day. Um, and that is the kind of flight highway that we're talking about when, we, when we're kind of focused on um, the migration corridors, which are really cool. So I'm gonna put one of those photos up on the screen for you guys to check out. And then I'm gonna hand it back on over um, and kind of let us wrap up. But um, I just wanna thank you guys so much for joining the birds and I today and letting me meander on about um, all of this migration science. So take a look at this map. And this is kind of um, what, where, the, uh, where golden eagles migrate in spring and fall. So you can see a really dense uh, kind of use of that highway migration and it comes all the way down into Wyoming right into the spot that we're in. And that just highlights the super highly used migration highway and corridor um, that we see uh, the birds at least that exist in Wyoming and surrounding areas, including Montana. Um, and those are birds that we've actually put GPS trackers on. So this is a map uh, using our own data. And this highlights just where those birds go during migration um, and you know what kind of uh, route they're taking. And this is useful for many reasons. One of the main being that there may be um, wind turbine uh, plots set up along their migration route. 
And um, during this migration period, like I said, there can be, you know, two to 300 birds a day, or there can be 2,000 birds on that migration path a day. Um, and so we find it very, very important to make sure that we um, uh, give the knowledge and, and all of this information to the right people so that they can decide, you know, if I have a turbine farm and I know I'm in this flight path, maybe I need to shut down for the two weeks that the migration period is going to last. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Sarah and Sarah Ann. Those presentations were amazing. Um, we do have some interesting questions from our participants um, and I'll just go from the top down. Um, it's 11.55, so just about five more minutes until noon, but please, uh, we are happy to stick around um, to answer questions beyond that. Um, so the first question is um, probably for both of you. Uh, do you find in the wildlife art world that many artists are also professional scientists and or work closely with scientists? Um, I can speak a little bit to that just like in, uh, I know a lot of, of scientists and um, uh, naturalists and any people in the science world that um, will do a field journal and they are incredible artists as well so um, watercolor and, and all kinds of um, mediums uh, I've seen used in field journals and that's just documenting a specific species or something like that that they're looking at um, so I, I definitely think that there is an aspect a connective um, kind of uh, tissue that that connects the artist world with uh, the science world because we are so observant of all these tiny details that maybe um, the just you know uneducated I might not know to look for um, but yeah I definitely think there's a connection yeah and maybe this is a little bit of a museum plug but we have an exhibit coming up called urban wildlife and all of the artists featured in that exhibit worked very closely with scientists and naturalists to um, create their artworks. And it's a collaboration with Creature Conserve to kind of show that art and science can work in tandem to spread messages of conservation or the endangerment of certain species. And um, so, you know, this exhibit is solely focused on that, but there are definitely a plethora of other artists featured in our museums that are scientists unto themselves, even if it's just some form of citizen science, which is still very, very important for uh, discovery. Thank you, Sari. And, and that exhibit opens on October 10th at the museum. So be sure to come check it out. And um, James Prosek, one artist that Sari featured in her presentation was in a summer exhibit at the museum in 2018 called Invisible Boundaries. Um, and he uh, collaborated with scientists Arthur Middleton and other photographers and videographers um, to create an exhibit that uh, explored the, the elk's migration um, from around Yellowstone outward. Um, so that was a heavily art and science related exhibit. So yeah, it happens a lot. <laughs> um, all right, second question. This is for Sari. Uh, you had mentioned that in the way, that the way in which we are analyzing and looking at migration today, is through a white Eurocentric way. Mm -hmm. In your research, what were some main differences between the way that white settlers and colonizers interpreted migration uh, as opposed to indigenous populations? Um, I do want to preface by saying that I do not have a strong enough research background on that to maybe give a full and complete answer to your question. Um, but part of what I wanted to reference by saying that is we often look to Western civilizations like Europe um, for scientific knowledge and that the knowledge of indigenous peoples, which dates back much, much farther than we could ever really know, is often ignored or not considered as reputable as Western science. Um, and there's a lot of ways that different tribes of indigenous peoples engage with raptors specifically within the United States um, that you know white Europeans were never a part of. And so like, for example, the rehab center that I worked at in um, 
Oregon, we used to collect all of the raptor feathers that we found either from our patients or from our permanent residents. And um, we would donate those to indigenous tribes in the area that they use for all sorts of ceremonial purposes. And again, I can't speak too in depth to the specifics, but I hope that answers some of your question. And it's definitely something that I'm working on doing more research on is the way that certain ways of knowing are ignored today by, um, you know, settlers and colonizers. Thank you, Sari. Uh, and remember, if you have a question for our panelists, you can enter it in the Q&A um, tab at the bottom of your screen there. Um, so the next question, um, I think, uh, uh, can be addressed to both of you. Maybe, Sarah, you can start, and then, um, Sarah, you can take it from there. Uh, what is our responsibility as humans to mitigate the risks um, or costs of bird migration, specifically risks that are not human created? That's a really, really hard question because there's so many things to do. And I mean, from an art world perspective, I think just sharing information, sharing stories, learning from those things is really, really important. Um, and I think some of it just comes down to not getting in the bird's way. Um, you know, we may be a little less impactful to birds, but we build these massive highway structures. We build all these different buildings and it impedes all sorts of animals migration paths. And that isn't necessarily something directly that we intended to happen, but it does happen. And there are very few intact migration corridors, especially in Wyoming. Um, and I think Sarah will be able to better answer this question. Um, but I think a good start is always just sharing the stories and the information that you learn with others because education is the first really important step. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, number one, and it's what drives my passion behind my job, um, a huge mitigator and um, preemptive kind of conservation tactic uh, is to start with education. And that um, creates a connection for the audience with, you know, an experience that they had with maybe a wild animal. Um, maybe they have their own story that they've experienced with um, a bird or, or a deer or something. And just bringing that and be able to, being able to connect that with an educational experience that gives the information of um, different ways that we can uh, practice conservation in our own backyard, um, giving stopover, you know, little places for birds to, to hang out in a storm, um, like a birdhouse is, is a great way. Our yards are migration stopovers for a lot of birds. Um, other things like Sarian had said, um, not getting in their way is a huge one. Um, roads are, are a huge uh, danger to raptors just as well as every other type of wildlife because you know there's nothing like a road in nature. So um, there's nothing like a car in nature either. So you know there's, there's nothing that's traveling 65 to 80 mile an hour in a, in a straight line and, and when they come in contact with these roads, whether it be a raptor that's um, decided that, man, it's easy to hunt on a, on a road where, you know, there's mice and stuff around due to food that humans might have thrown out or trash that might have been on the side of the road. Um, those are huge um, instances where that's one of the number one reasons that we get birds in is a car strike. Um, and that's often due to the fact that humans have, you know, change that environment and then the birds realized hey maybe it might, might be easy for me to hunt right here with all these rodents and things around the road uh, i don't know what cars are uh, and so they go down for a mouse maybe and a car strikes them um, other ways uh, i mean education number one not getting in their way um, i think really it just comes down to sharing our knowledge right and, and sharing our passion um, for wildlife and and why they're important and i guess that does that doubles back to education again and it doubles back to just fostering the environment where a connection can happen for um anyone to to build that you know relationship with um, the idea of conservation and the importance of having an intact ecosystem um, and why it's so important because there are so few intact ecosystems left um, in in the world that we haven't you know touched in some way or another so um, the fact that that we all get to live here and that people get to visit this place is so so amazing and important um, and that's one one aspect uh, about 
what I do that I love is that I can welcome you into this environment, but I can also highlight for you why it's so important and why it's so special. Um, and, and you guys do an amazing job of that there as well. Um, but I think those are some ways that we can, we can all kind of work to mitigate um, and, and maybe just like, you know, share the, the idea of conservation and the idea of um, that these animals work so hard on their migrations and during their mating seasons and maybe just give them a little bit of a break. <laughs> All right, um, we have quite a few more questions. So I'll just go down the line. Um, Sarah, this one is uh, for you. Uh, Judy asks, does the great gray migrate or not based on food supply in the area? So, yes, um, Judy, yes. So uh, the great gray, although there is so much we don't know about the drivers behind their behavior when it comes to migration, we do know that availability of food, and this goes for any raptor, availability of food is going to be a base driver in migration. Um, so that will always be a, a, a base kind of um, shaper of what their migration behavior is going to be for that year. Um, say if there was another, you know, big thaw freeze event with snow, great gray owls um, next year, they could pop over into Idaho and decide they're going to hang out there for the next two years or um, something like that. So that would be a short, short distance migration. Whereas if the food supply stays great and healthy um, and other factors don't contribute, they may just stay in the same spot. So um, the cool, but also kind of a little bit frustrating thing about migration and the things we do and do not know about it is that it's hard to pin down exactly, you know, black and white an answer of yes, this bird only migrates or yes, this bird only um, stays solid or uh, in one place. Um, but yeah, uh, food and availability of food is always, always going to be a base driver of um, migratory behavior. Great. And uh, another bird related question for Sarah. How heavy are the birds, each of them, um, that uh, were the education birds today? So these birds are a lot lighter than you might think, unless um, you heard when I said they have hollow bone structure. Um, so we look, we often look at these birds and the size of them and we think, well, if my, if a dog was that size, they would weigh, you know, 15 pounds or 10 pounds. Um, but there's the trick that these guys are kind of playing on you and they have hollow bone structure um, in order to aid in their, you know, ability of flight. But that also means that they appear a lot larger than they actually weigh. Um, so for instance, Frost, the, the little American kestrel weighs in at about 0.3 pounds. Um, so I weigh him every day. This, today he weighed about 95 grams. So he's a little bit lower on, the, on that scale right now. Um, Taiga weighs in at about two pounds. So, you know, two foot tall owl weighs in at about two pounds. She's got a lot of feathers, again, hollow bone structure. Um, and then Gus the Golden Eagle, those guys are a bit bigger, but still with that size, he only weighs about six and a half pounds. Awesome. Um, Sari, question for you uh, from Morgan. As a writer, how do you think writers could learn from visual artists who engage with wildlife as a subject matter. Yeah, thank you, Morgan. Um, I mean, she kind of knows that I do write about visual artwork in my creative writing. Um, but part of what I really like about the connection of a visual art and a written art is you can convey something different in both of those things. So one is dependent on language pretty much solely and alone and the other is dependent on the visual alone on color on composition um, and in my most recent work i've sort of started experimenting with what happens if you kind of combine them both together so in what ways can words also be a visual form of art um, so something I've been looking at is like, how can I change the way words lie on a page to represent an animal's movement? So, you know, in a piece of visual artwork, I can look at something and say, okay, I can see the way a bear picks up his paws and puts them down. I can see the way a chicken's feet curl in like this and extend when they put them back down. Um, but it's, it doesn't always feel the same to describe that on the page. Um, so I've been playing with what if I can make the words into that shape or gesture towards that shape. Um, and so in terms of what can writers learn from visual artists, I think it's looking at unique and different ways of representation 
and what effect that representation has and how we can experiment with that in written work um, and how we can use writing to kind of allude to some of the same things that visual artists are alluding to either by you know using silhouettes in our writing using something reminiscent of textile by weaving together different sections in a way that's like beautifully stirring on the page both from a language perspective and from a visual perspective. Thank you, that sounds amazing. Uh, okay, so uh, a question for Sarah from Marina. Uh, does tracking birds affect their migration journey in any way? How do you ensure that the tracking devices do not interfere with their movement? Great question, Marina. So um, no, it does not affect their migration journey in any way other than the five minutes they spend with us on the ground. Um, yeah, this is a really, really good question because it, you know, when I say we trap them and we work with them, well, what does that mean for them? Um, so basically when we trap and, and put a GPS tracking unit on a bird, that bird spends in, you know, at the most about five minutes with us on the ground. Um, it's, it entails coming in on some uh, kind of bait that we have, whether it be like a fake pigeon or a fake owl when the bird comes down on that on that bait there's a soft net that goes over the bird um, and we are very experienced in being out there with the bird in hand in about 30 seconds because we don't want that bird to be stressed or spend much time in that net at all um, so birds in hand we take them to a small tent that's set up on the hillside we take measurements of um, their beak their head their wing cord uh, and their feathers just to have that for science scientific use, scientific observation. Um, and then what we do is when we put a GPS tracker on, it's it's kind of like a backpack a little bit for these guys. For great gray owls, it's on the tail and that tail falls off altogether in the fall. So no, no big problem for the great gray owls. We get our trackers back and we get a bunch of feathers to look at too. But with the golden eagles, hawks, things like that, um, they get a backpack. And the backpack is sewn on uh, specifically with a certain type of thread that breaks the minute it has too much pressure on it. And then that backpack would just come off and we would go retrieve it and the bird would be unharmed. Um, so we, the, we, any practice we have in the field with our research team uh, has been generously thought over, gone over again and again to make sure that um, anything we're doing is not negatively impacting these species that we want to um, help and, and do all this research with. Thank you. Um, I'm going to combine uh, two questions here. So people are asking about bird feeding, um, Kit and Patricia. Um, one question is, if you put food out for birds in the winter, does it alter their migration path so that maybe they don't migrate as far or migrate at all? Um, and with that in consideration, when is the best time to, um, to feed birds um, from bird feeders? So if you'll notice in my in my presentation, I, I, I steered away from saying put out a bead for a bird feeder, but I did suggest putting out um, bird housing, you know, like a bird house or, or a shelter for the birds to kind of have a stopover. Um, what we're doing, and I, I know this from experience because working with raptors, we focus on all the different raptors we have here. Um, but when you put out a bird feeder, you are actively setting up a food chain in your backyard, right? So um, you'll have, you know, squirrels and that kind of stuff come in, you'll have smaller birds come in, and the birds that monopoly and monopolize that situation happening in your backyard are the raptors, um, like sharp shin hawks, cooper's hawks, who will come in and take a bird or two or three off of your bird feeder. Um, we do not openly suggest placing bird feeders in your backyard because it does have the um, chance to alter behavior, um, to have birds staying longer because there is an open food source. Um, unless, you know, there's the, it, it just, it doesn't work so well when we can't guarantee we're always going to be able to provide that food throughout a really, really harsh winter. Um, so there's the possibility that it, it could influence uh, when certain birds leave if there's this great food source and I don't have to leave um, because I don't, you know, there, I don't have to fight for food. There's no um, competition here, then they may stay longer and or try to stay through the winter. And if you live somewhere where there's a really harsh winter, that's going to be an issue because in a harsh winter, we can't guarantee we'll keep the bird feeder stocked all winter. Um, 
and there are different types of migrators. So there are migrators that are kind of the calendar migrator, and then there's the migrator based on weather. So those calendar migrators may not stick around. They may be out, you know, it's like clockwork for some reason. They know that it's time to go, whereas the weather-based migrators um, may stick around and go, oh, well, there's still food here. Um, so yeah, we, we don't openly suggest bird feeders, but I'm not going to tell you to take yours down. Um, but I, I wouldn't suggest that as a way of mitigating the harsh uh, and uh, harshness and challenges of bird migration. I would suggest um, putting up, you know, a bird house or um, some kind of little shelter where it's kind of a stopover for them if a big storm does come through. Great. Um, and let's say one more question here from Jane um, for Sarah. How often do you get requests from artists to spend time with the birds? I know the museum has organized um, live sort of uh, observation and sketch sketching programs with the Raptor Center, but that's been many years ago. Um, do you still get those kinds of requests? We do often. So um, we do get those those requests um, often and, and not even just in like that media, but also photography and, and other ways as well. Um, and so we have many um, programs that we uh, we do for photography groups um, and, and oftentimes people will actually come if they say, you know, I would really love to paint or sculpt this bird. Well, instead of having to have the bird out for three hours on the glove and having it fading and doing all these things, we can do these really, really high quality photos of every angle of the bird, um, set up a, a, a short, you know, um, kind of experience with them meeting the bird so they have a better understanding. Um, of that bird and that species, and then also getting those photos. And we've, we've been doing that quite a bit for the last couple of years. Um, one thing we always say when it's an art related or photograph related um, program is that uh, we always encourage people to sit and listen to our information about the bird before their you know, mind starts going down the artistic path of how they're going to portray this bird um, or animal because um, we firmly believe that the more you know about a species or a specific bird, the better you're going to portray it, whether it be in a photograph, a sculpture, um, or painting. So, yeah. Great. Um, all right, everyone. Uh, to all the participants, thank you for engaging throughout uh, this presentation and for your wonderful questions. Uh, Sarian and Sarah, thank you for your wonderful presentations. We learned so much, um, and especially that the disciplines of art and science, even though they seem so disparate, are actually closely intertwined. So um, really wonderful connection there. Um, and Sarian, thank you for conceiving of this wonderful uh, uh, presentation. And uh, th thank you for your partnership, Teton Raptor Center. Um, all right, well, I, this will conclude this webinar. Um, and please, uh, one more time, I will state that uh, everyone who participated can expect an email uh, with the recording from um, this webinar. So please feel free to share it and watch it as you like. All right, thanks for participating everyone so much. We'll see you later. <laughs>